The FBI hopes this latest video will stir new leads in the murder of 18-year-old Samantha Koenig. Authorities say this surveillance video from Alaska shows Keyes abducting Koenig from her job at a coffee stand in Anchorage on February 1st. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. As normal, this is going to be a multi-part series and videos will come out as soon as possible. If you could hit the like button and comment down below, that would be greatly appreciated as the engagement helps my content get distributed further. And of course, if you're new here, please subscribe and hit the little bell icon so you never miss an upload because I'm bad at keeping a schedule. Today, we'll be doing another serial killer deep dive and this time we're discussing Israel Keys. Let's get into it. Didn't sleep much last night. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> These are good work apparently. I had muscles sore this morning. I didn't even know I had it. Really? <laughs> Where's muscles? Jeez, that's a good thing you didn't get a full on. This reminds me of like those uh, late night infomercials where you just sell those machines that shock your abs and stuff. Oh. It's like that. On you have one or you bought one of them? No, I can't really go. Oh. <laughs> If I tried it once, it's really cool. You get ripped from it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, so, uh, you weren't too taken with the uh, machine, basically? No, no, all the ab? Yeah. Shocker things? Yeah, all those things are like freaking fingernail on a chalk. Israel Keyes could be the most heinous serial killer in the United States. What we know about him is very limited, and until his arrest, he barely existed on paper. No one had any idea who Israel Keyes was. He was a killer that had no preferred victim type, no consistent method of attack. He had military training and knew how to evade detection from the police. He drove for miles and miles with potential victims in Canada, the U.S., and abroad. He drew inspiration from Ted Bundy and called Dennis Rader a wimp for expressing remorse for his victims. Many of his victims' bodies were never recovered, and he made the mistake of confessing to two. He allegedly went to Mexico to modify his body to be better at killing. Had it not been a few mistakes, he could have gone on for decades without being caught. Part 1. The Disappearance of Samantha Koenig February 2, 2012, in Anchorage, Alaska, a young barista opened up the Common Grounds coffee stand. When she arrived at work, she immediately noticed something wasn't right. The stand had been left unlocked, none of the closing duties had been done, and the cash register had been left open without any cash in it. She checked who had been in last and was surprised to learn it had been Samantha Koenig, an 18-year-old hire that had been a great employee so far. Samantha was still new, but she'd been working at the kiosk for less than a month and had always done thorough closes. She called her boss and told her about her concern. Her boss said that she would take care of it and open up the kiosk as usual. Her boss called Anchorage police and requested an officer to look into things. At that point, it did appear that Samantha had made off with the previous day's cash and disappeared. The kiosk had a panic button inside and it hadn't been pressed, and the kiosk didn't look like there were any signs of distress. Officers began an investigation, which initially wasn't taken very seriously. They interviewed her father, James Koenig, who had talked to Samantha the previous evening. She had asked him to bring her dinner. Then they spoke to Samantha's boyfriend, Dwayne. 
He said that the couple had been fighting. He said that Samantha had accused him of cheating and told him that she was going to a friend's house to cool off. James had attempted to find Samantha that evening. She didn't have her truck with her. Her boyfriend had it. When her boyfriend had gone to pick Samantha up when her shift ended around 8.30 p.m., he had noticed that the kiosk was dark and it appeared empty. He said that he got out and looked in the window and saw that Samantha wasn't there. The tone of the investigation began to shift when the owner of the kiosk gave officers surveillance footage from the night before. It showed Samantha at 8 o'clock, calm, chatting with a customer through the window and making a beverage. The footage didn't have audio and the customer was out of the camera's range. Something shifted when Samantha abruptly turned the lights off. That was when officers knew this wasn't a teenager that had gone off to blow off some steam. She had been kidnapped. An abduction seemed so absurd. The kiosk was next to a popular gym, as well as a well-traveled road. The abductor had been bold. He also hadn't seemed to be in a rush, having been at the kiosk for over 17 minutes. He had also been able to keep Samantha calm. She hadn't appeared scared until he began to lead her out of the building. Surveillance from a next-door building gave officers another angle. It showed a man forcing Samantha into a white Chevrolet pickup truck. From both cameras, officers could tell that the man was very tall. He wore a ski mask and a black jacket. Because Samantha had remained so calm, officers had been inclined to believe that she had known the abductor. He might have been someone she trusted, as she had seemingly left without so much as calling for help. Her father James hounded local police to investigate this as a kidnapping. James was a trucker by trade and was known to have a shady past. He raised Samantha as a single parent and he loved his daughter fiercely. He was not willing to let his missing daughter fall between the cracks of police bureaucracy. He arranged for a candlelit vigil, assembled a group of volunteers to put posters up, and he took donations and established a reward fund. He felt responsible. Had he brought Samantha dinner that night when she'd asked, he would have been at the kiosk at 11 p.m., he had been horrified to learn that he was one of the primary suspects, as well as her boyfriend, Dwayne. The only thing James could do was rile up the might of Alaska and keep the case in the public eye and to put pressure on officers to continue investigating. He helped to bring the case to national attention. Samantha was a senior in high school. She was kind and well-liked by her classmates. She was responsible, worked hard, and rose above them despite having troubles in life and was succeeding. She had wanted to work with animals or become a nurse. She was described as being someone who looked out for others, making sure they had enough and were included. Dwayne had seen something the night that Samantha had gone missing. He had received a text from her at 11.30 p.m. saying that she would be spending the night at a friend's house. Then he said something odd had happened. At 3 a.m. he felt a need to go outside to the front of the house where they parked their vehicles, and there was a man going through Samantha's truck. The men stood and looked at each other for a moment, and then the strange man walked away. 
He and James searched the vehicle and noticed the only thing missing was Samantha's driver's license that she kept in the top visor pocket. When asked why they hadn't called police, he said that he and James believed that the officers wouldn't file a missing person report for at least 24 hours after Samantha had disappeared. There was no physical evidence in the case. The crime scene had been contaminated when it wasn't contained initially. They had no indication that Samantha had left the state. There was no record of her on any ships, planes, or have crossed the border. By February 17th, Samantha had been missing for nearly three weeks when her father got a text message from her phone. The text said, Connor Park sign under the pick of Albert. Ain't she purdy? Officers suited up. They had no idea what they would find at the park. Connor Park was less than five miles from downtown Anchorage, and there pinned to a bulletin board was a Ziploc bag containing a photo of Samantha and a ransom note. The photograph was a sign of life. In the photo was Samantha with a man's hand holding a recent newspaper. The picture was shown to James, and the first thing he noticed was that Samantha's hair was braided, and she never styled her hair like that. Along with the photo was a ransom note. It had been typed on plain white paper and demanded $30,000. The note said that if the demand was met, Samantha would be released in six months. The note contained the numbers on Samantha's debit card and had instructions to deposit the money into the account. This gave officers and the FBI investigators a way to potentially capture the kidnapper if he used the debit card to take the money out. At the FBI's request, James deposited $5,000 from the reward money fund into the account. The FBI thought it would be best not to put the entire demand, hoping that it would frustrate the kidnapper and force him to reach out again. Four hours after the ransom money was deposited, someone tried to withdraw $600 from an ATM in Anchorage. Then the person began to go from ATM to ATM to withdraw the maximum daily amount, totaling more than $1,000 on the first night. It took several days for the images from the ATM machines to come back from FBI experts, and the experts determined that the man had an athletic frame. He was wearing a dark hoodie with white paint splattered on the front. Another key piece of information was that the expert believed that the suspect was likely a Marine based on a logo on one of his hoodies. Samantha had been missing for a month by the time the officers and the FBI had a vague description of the suspect and had been able to confirm that they were still in Anchorage. However, on March 7th, they got an unexpected call. The debit card had been used to withdraw $400 in Wilcox, Arizona. The kidnapper had left the state. An hour later, there was another withdrawal on the debit card, this time in Lordsburg, New Mexico. Again, he attempted to withdraw more than the daily limit. Then at the same ATM, the suspect used the debit card again, this time to check the balance in the account, $3,598.91. He withdrew another $80 to get as close as he could to the daily $500 limit. The kidnapper had used a smaller bank chain, one that didn't use a sophisticated surveillance system. It took the FBI two days to get images, which confirmed it was likely the same suspect that had made the withdrawals in Anchorage. A tall Caucasian man wearing bulky, excessive layers in an attempt to hide his frame. He wore a hat, sunglasses, and a face mask with jeans and white tennis shoes. Officers were concerned that the suspect had left Alaska. It didn't bode well for Samantha. Officers were unsure if she was with him or if she was still in Alaska. Were there more than one kidnapper? Did they take her across the border? And why were they still risking capture by using her debit card? Local police, all FBI offices in the area, and Texas Rangers were all distributed a be on the lookout bolo flyer with Samantha's picture and the blurry image from the suspect from the ATMs, and the car that could be seen in the back of the ATM photos, likely a rental. The Texas Rangers are a state police agency famous for tracking down Bonnie and Clyde. They specialize in criminal and special investigations such as apprehending wanted felons, suppressing significant disturbances, and assisting smaller local law enforcement agencies. They didn't have a lot to go on. They were looking for a white male driving a white rental car from Alaska and in possession of a debit card from a missing girl. He seemed to be traveling eastbound on the I-10 highway. The card had been used most recently on March 12th in Shepard, Texas. It had been used at 2.47 a.m. and the FBI were able to determine, based on the shape of the windshield, that the suspect was driving an older model white Ford Focus. 
Bolo flyers were distributed to Texas Highway Patrol officers, and there was another ATM withdrawal in Humboldt, Texas. And on March 13th, Texas Ranger Stephen Rayburn was patrolling local hotel and motel parking lots when around 11 a.m. he spotted a white rental outside of a Quality Inn in Lufkin, Texas. They decided to send an officer to stake out the vehicle and get a look at the driver. By 11.30, the ranger saw a tall white male begin to pack the Ford Focus and get into it. By now, the Anchorage PD and the FBI were all patched in and waiting on law enforcement in Texas to keep them updated. The suspect exceeded the local speed limit by 2 km per hour and allowed the officer to pull the driver over. The suspect calmly pulled over and stopped in a cafe parking lot. The officer asked for his license and registration and was shocked when he handed over an Alaskan driver's license. The name on the license was Israel Keys. Backup was called and the Texas Highway Patrol officer Brian Henry joined Rayburn. Keyes was in his mid-30s, he was wearing wraparound sunglasses and a white tank top with jeans. Without being asked, Keyes told Rayburn that he was in town for his sister's wedding and was sharing a room with his brother. Keyes asked why he was pulled over and was told that they were looking into a kidnapping that had occurred in Alaska. The officer ran his license number and noted his address was listed in Anchorage. He also stated that Keyes had no criminal record, no warrants, or even a speeding ticket. The officers indicated that Keyes was beginning to display nervous physical cues. He was also rambling and offering up information about his recent whereabouts, unsolicited. Keyes was asked when he arrived in Texas and how he got there. He said he came in on Thursday and said that he'd flown from Anchorage to Las Vegas and had driven from there to Texas. He mentioned his daughter, and officers asked where she was. They had noted clothing in the car that looked like it belonged to a little girl. He said that she was with his brother in Wells, Texas. Officers asked to search Keyes' wallet and car, and his demeanor changed to aggravated. From what officers could see from outside the car, there were white sneakers matching what the suspect had been wearing in the ATM surveillance, as well as several paper maps and rolls of cash in the passenger side door with red dye on it. Keyes was no longer cooperating with officers, and they had to make the decision to arrest him or let him go. Texas has looser probable cause laws. If an officer suspects that a vehicle has been used in connection with a crime, it's up to the officer's discretion to search it. However, they also had to take into consideration Alaskan law, as any trial would take place there, and they couldn't risk having potential key evidence being dismissed in an unlawful search. Officers in Alaska decided to allow the search. Israel Keyes was arrested, which gave Texas officers authority to search for what they wanted. They were looking for Samantha's debit card. And upon opening Keyes' wallet, they found the card with the pin etched into the plastic on the card. At this point, there were five officers on the scene and one was documenting the car's contents. They located several hoodies and jackets in the trunk, as well as a face mask similar to the one seen in the ATM image, gloves, a cell phone with the battery and SIMS card removed, a gun, and a black ski mask. They got him. He was arrested in Texas in March after withdrawing money from Koenig's bank account, ending his cross-country killing spree. Uh, we're jumping here, and the first thing I gotta tell you, uh, Israel, we talked about a little bit, uh, uh, earlier, that that stunt yesterday in the courtroom did not go over well. Um, What's that? Well, with a lot of folks, not the least of which were the uh, were the prosecutors. And that was the delay actually getting in here. Is we knew he had some legal questions, and so we reached out for him to say, "Hey, uh, Israel says he's got some questions. Are you guys available to speak to him?" And, uh, <laughs> um, I I couldn't even get one. One of them was in court, and the other one said, "You know, basically." What the fuck? After yesterday, so uh, they they didn't think that was too funny. Um, so and why are they afraid I'd actually get away? <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be embarrassing for them, I guess. <laughs> no, it's. Uh... Israel Keyes didn't have a criminal record, which was surprising. Usually, perpetrators of this magnitude had a lengthy criminal history that showed an escalation in criminal activity. 
Keyes barely existed on paper. Much of what we know about Keyes is from his own interrogations, his interviews with his mother, and journals recovered from his home. Keyes had all the markers of a psychopath, and he understood from a young age that he wasn't like everyone else, and had to hide his true nature to blend in with his peers. They know they're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about what I'm telling you, the kind of things I'm telling you, is me. Okay. How long have you been two different people? <laughs> long time. 14 years. It was important for the FBI to learn as much as they could about Israel Keys. Like many other serial killers, they wanted to understand the key influences in his life that led him to become such a dangerous man. Asking the question asked for decades, are serial killers born or are they made the way they are? Keyes was born on January 7th in 1978 in Cove, Utah. He was the second of 10 children of his parents, Heidi and John Jeffrey, who went by Jeff Keyes. His parents had met as teenagers in Los Angeles, California, and were fervently anti-government. His parents were both societal misfits and could never seem to find where they belonged. They had both been raised Mormons and had deeply instilled religious beliefs. They were married when Heidi was 21 and Jeff was 22. They wanted to raise their children in nature. They moved to Utah, where they had their first child at home birth. Heidi would give birth to all of her children without any assistance from hospitals. Neither she nor her husband believed in modern medicine. They also didn't want the government to interfere with their lives, and there was too much paperwork with hospitals, birth certificates, immunizations, social security numbers, medical records, were not something Jeff wanted his family involved with. While in Utah, they were visited by government officials who had concerns about the children. They packed up and moved to Colville, Washington, where they purchased 160 acres of rural property. Israel, along with all his siblings, were homeschooled in a one-bedroom cabin. They grew up without heat, running water, or electricity for most of their childhood. Jeff worked in the area as a handyman, appliance repair technician, and also did construction. Heidi stayed home with the children. On the Colville property, Jeff was slowly constructing a permanent home for the family by himself, mainly using resources found on the land. Heidi recalled her husband's religious beliefs to be extreme. Their children were raised with no interference from the outside world, not even a radio. They also had few friends and only interacted with other children within their church. Eventually, they left their Mormon church and instead became fundamentalist Christians. Their new church, the Ark, had extreme white supremacist ideologies, which Keyes himself recognized as impacting his formative years. Though he knew from a young age, he didn't have the same religious beliefs as his parents. The Keyes children grew up in extreme poverty. Israel had physical deformities in his toes from wearing shoes that were too small for his feet for many years. They ate what was grown and hunted on the property, and their injuries were treated at home, no matter how serious. Israel was the oldest son, and when Jeff wasn't home, he was the man of the house. He often was responsible for his younger siblings, more than both of his parents. The Keys believed their way of life made them superior to others. They didn't rely on technology, capitalism, or anyone else to help raise their family. They were proof that the old way of life worked, and they had ten healthy children to attest to it. But it wasn't a perfect life. In winter, Heidi would take the children to her aunt's house in Palm Springs to keep them warm. In their new church, Israel was exposed to guns and took a keen interest. He became interested in learning everything he could about how they worked, which ones were banned, and how to acquire prohibited weapons. In his teens, he began breaking into homes and stealing guns. He would then resell them as a way of making money. Israel also said that occasionally he would break into a home and just move things around, then wait in the woods to watch the homeowners come home and freak out. He described this as an entertaining activity. At 14, he started to get bored with breaking into homes and escalated to torturing animals. This was also when he began to hide his sadistic behaviors, as he discovered that his friends were appalled by this behavior. His friends had told their parents, who in turn told Israel's parents, and he didn't like that. 
When talking about his past, Keyes stopped being forthcoming with his escalating violent behavior. When asked directly if he hurt anyone during his childhood, he deflected, indicating that he likely had sexual or physical assault victims beginning as early as childhood. When he was 15, he started the construction of his own cabin a mile away from the family's construction, and when he finished a year later, he moved into it. Israel also at this time started working on a construction company with other members of the Ark. Once Israel began living alone, separated from his family, he became obsessed with hunting. Through hunting, he honed his patience and learned to stay still for hours at a time. He also honed in on tracking and relying on all his senses to become a stealthy predator. When I was smart, I would let them come to me. This remote area. Come, come go to a remote area that's not anywhere near where you live, but that other people go to as well. He said that while he was practicing his stealth and camouflage, he would stumble upon people on these hunting trips, hikers, other hunters, or just people on their properties, and he would try to get as close as possible without them noticing. He would visualize killing and hiding their bodies. When he was as young as 13, he knew he had urges to kill. He was caught shoplifting when he was 16, and his parents searched his cabin and found a cache of stolen weapons. They forced him back into the family home, where he could be kept close. Heidi said that she could see that he was separating himself from the church and was more defiant at home. He was rebelling against Jeff and the constraints he imposed on the family. When Israel told his parents that he didn't believe in God or organized religion, Jeff exploded. He disowned Israel and kicked him out. Though Heidi didn't share the same sentiments as her husband, and she kept in contact with Israel, she loved her son no matter what he believed in. In 1996, Jeff decided to move the family to Oregon. Israel had been reluctant to join the family, but did in order to help support his mother and his siblings. In Oregon, he helped his father build houses to sell. In 1997, Jeff again picked up the family for reasons unknown and relocated them to Smyrna, Maine. There, they joined an Amish community. Jeff purchased a property in Malone, New York, and signed the deed over to Israel. Israel didn't live with the family while they lived with the Amish. He didn't believe in the Amish lifestyle and felt it was silly. He had enough with living off-grid and being dragged from one extreme religion to the next. Israel had been forced to leave behind a girlfriend back in Colville and expressed deep regret and heartbreak for leaving her. In his journals, he had mixed feelings about leaving his family, but ultimately decided he wanted to live his own life. Israel got his GED and in 1996, at 20 years old, he enlisted in the military. What was most odd about his enlistment was that Keyes didn't have a birth certificate or social security number. Technically, he didn't exist on paper, according to the US government. He had told people he had grown up Amish as an easier way of explaining why he didn't understand sports references or pop culture or many things that normal people experienced. Keyes himself admitted that he enjoyed his life in the military. The structure and organization were a welcome change from his chaotic childhood, and he said he was a good soldier. He was an infantryman stationed at Fort Hood in Texas. While in the army, he began to experiment with drugs and alcohol. He would use cocaine heavily and go on weekend long benders, but always be able to sober up in time for duty, and only a few knew the extent of his substance abuse. He admitted to blacking out several times, but had learned to control and keep his growing alcoholism in check around his family. In the army, he had continued a long-distance relationship with his girlfriend back in Colville but had also been dating a woman near the base in Washington. He had been engaged to the Colville girl at one point, but she could tell things had changed in their relationship. Eventually, he called off their wedding and said he had been seeing someone at the base. The woman's name was Tammy. She was 10 years older than Israel, and it started as a casual relationship until Tammy got pregnant. He was arrested and charged with a DOI by the military police and honorably discharged in 2001. When he left the army, he settled down in Nia Bay, Washington with Tammy. Tammy and Keyes got along well. They both had traumatic childhoods and bonded over their unusual upbringing. Tammy was half indigenous and half African American and lived on the Macaw Reservation where Keyes moved in with her. 
Keys liked that Tammy didn't give him a hard time. She never questioned when he came home late or talked to other women. In Nia Bay, he would go on trips for days or weeks at a time. He was hired as a parks and recreation worker on the reservation, and when his daughter was born, he was a devoted father. He loved children, having helped raise most of his younger siblings, and he was an excellent caregiver. Tammy also had an eight-year-old son from a previous relationship, and Keys took over as a parental figure when he moved in with Tammy. Two weeks after his daughter's birth, Israel's father died. He left to attend the funeral in Maine and was gone for over a week. During that time, Tammy had little communication with him. There were no records of a funeral for Jeff Keyes. There was also no death certificate or any record at any funeral home or cemetery. Investigators learned that while the family had been relocating again, Jeff had gotten very ill due to an ongoing thyroid condition that had never been treated and he died somewhere along that trip. Tammy noted that in their time together, she couldn't remember a time when Israel went into detail about his childhood experiences. They were always broad and vague. He also said that when he drank, he sometimes would say things that didn't make sense to her. Once he said he was a bad person and that she didn't know him, and he had a black heart. She brushed it off as leftover trauma from his childhood. It was also during that time that he had an upside-down cross branded on his chest and got a pentagram tattooed on the back of his neck. She felt that he was rebelling against his religious upbringing and didn't think much about it at the time. In 2003, the couple separated and they shared custody of their daughter. Israel went on to date several women until he met Kimberly while she was working as a nurse in Port Angeles. And when Keyes was 29, he moved to Anchorage with Kimberly and he shared custody of his daughter with Tammy. In 2007, he also started his construction business in Alaska. In his relationship with Kimberly, he began taking long trips alone. He would fly into a state, rent a car, and put thousands of miles on the rental. He also started taking trips down to Tijuana, where he would get unknown medical procedures. One of those procedures was a nose job, and he also had dental work done, as can be seen in photographs. He simply wrote in his journals, medical procedure, but it was also speculated that he may have had Botox to reduce sweat and laser hair removal. Investigators noticed early on that he was extremely nervous about leaving DNA evidence behind on his victims, and it had been a point of pride that they never found any linking him to any crimes. What also shocked me was his travels to Victoria, British Columbia. He was here on April 22, 2006 for an overnight trip where he also rented a boat. There were no missing person cases during the time that Keyes was in town, but he traveled to Canada fairly often. Keyes generally traveled paying with cash when he could. He would also take the battery and SIM card out of his phones. Though there were still border crossings, hotel reservations, and car rentals where he needed to give credit card information, though sometimes those bookings would be under Kimberly's card. The FBI releases interviews and a timeline of events of confessed serial killer Israel Keys in hopes of identifying his homicide victims. I'm Molly Halpern of the Bureau, and this is Wanted by the FBI. Investigators say Israel Keys, who took his own life in jail, committed 11 homicides across the country between 2001 and 2012. Case agent Jolene Godin says investigators have identified three victims. It's really important to us to be able to bring some type of closure to family members that are still wondering what happened to their loved ones. Keys also admitted to multiple kidnappings, bank robberies, home invasions, and arsons. He told investigators he buried caches of money, tools, and weapons across the country to help him commit his crimes. Our primary concern is identifying additional homicide victims, but we're certainly also interested in identifying other crimes that he committed because it will help us put him in a particular place in the country. He's told FBI agents he related the most with convicted serial killer Ted Bundy. He didn't really have remorse. He didn't have empathy. Visit FBI.gov for details of Key's travels and interviews. Report tips to 1-800-CALL-FBI. That is where we are going to end this part. In the next one, we're going to go over his arrest, interrogation, and confessions. As always, please give this video a thumbs up if you like the content and subscribe for more if you haven't already. If you've done all that and want to support me and the channel, we have channel membership as well as Patreon to get early access, members only content and more. We also have merch and other goodies in the description box and links to all my socials. But until then, I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.
Upon Israel's arrest, he initially was held in Texas until he was extradited back to Anchorage, a legal process that took two weeks. FBI agents took over the investigation, which initially had the primary focus of locating Samantha Koenig, who at this point had been missing for over two months. While Israel was still in Texas, the FBI raided and tore through the house he shared with his girlfriend, Kimberly. They seized electronic devices, Key's vehicle, journals, and searched for any clues of Samantha. Kimberly was initially uncooperative with officers, believing Keyes was innocent. After his arrest, his mother and Tammy were both interviewed, and officers were intrigued that neither of those women were surprised or shocked by the allegations. They were both fully cooperative with law enforcement. His mother, Heidi, revealed that while Israel had been in Texas, he was acting very odd. She said that he had been unusually emotional and agitated. She said that he had also visited her on February 13th, two weeks after Samantha's disappearance, and she said that that visit had also been odd. She said that he had snuck out in the middle of the night leaving a note in his room, gone to fix the window and find a place to hide my guns. Heidi had said that wasn't entirely unusual behavior, and at the time, it made rational sense. Israel liked guns, and the windshield on his rental car had cracked on his drive up. He had left his daughter with Heidi and only answered messages sporadically, but had been gone for two nights. On the third day, he said that he was stranded in another town an hour away from where he had left. When they found him, he was disheveled, he and the car were covered in mud, and Israel was acting completely out of character. He was talking a mile a minute, with a litany of excuses attempting to explain where he'd been for two days. He normally was calm, cool, and collected, but that wasn't what was happening now. They went back to Heidi's home, and again Israel disappeared several more times. No one asked Israel to explain any further, and he didn't provide any details of where he had been. Heidi mentioned that she'd noticed Israel had been drinking heavily, much more than she'd seen in years past. He was also willing to talk to her church's elders, which was also notable since he had taken such a strong stance of anti-religion in the past. Right before his flights back to Anchorage, he gave Heidi $900 in cash to pay her back. Then he and his daughter flew back to Alaska on the 18th. Once Keyes was back in Anchorage after his extradition, he told officers he wanted to talk. Keyes was realistic about his circumstances and told officers that if his demands were met, he was an open book. Initially, his demands were that the death penalty would be off the table and that he wanted what he was going to tell officers to stay out of the media. He didn't want his crimes to impact his family, particularly his young daughter. He didn't want his daughter to Google his name and have his crimes attached to him. Really big concern to me is, um, you know, my kid's going to be around. I don't want her to, like, type my name in the computer and have it pop up. At the time of his arrest, the FBI had very little to tie him to Samantha's disappearance. All they had was the fraudulent use of a credit card, though in their first interview with Keyes, it was clear that he believed they had a lot more information on him and the FBI had to keep up that belief. They decided to go through the evidence in chronological order. They showed Keyes photos from the ATMs, clothing from the rentals that matched the photos, Samantha's debit card in his wallet as well as her cell phone, along with disturbing material on his computer's hard drive. They had also revealed that they had already interviewed Heidi and Tammy, threatening to release embarrassing details about his life to the press. In the first interview with Keyes, he opened up right away and began with the events on February 1st, when he kidnapped Samantha. He said that he had selected the Common Grounds coffee stand because it was open later than the other cafes, and he could see only one girl closing most nights. He had picked February 1st because there was a festival on the other side of town, and most police officers and residents would be there. He had observed the kiosk for several evenings to get a sense of the routine. Initially, he had only planned to rob the coffee stand. He said that he had never met or knew Samantha prior to abducting her. He had waited in his truck until it was close to closing before he went up to the kiosk. He noticed that the girl in shift didn't have a vehicle, as there wasn't one in the parking lot. He wore a ski mask as well as a police scanner in his ear and ordered a coffee. 
Samantha made the drink, an Americano, and handed it back to him. He made sure to examine the coffee stand carefully, confirming that she was alone. That was when he pulled out a gun and demanded her to hand over the money in the cash register. He directed her to turn the lights off, then told her to get the money from the cash register. Samantha had told him that her father was on the way to bring her dinner, but slipped up, first saying he would be there in half an hour, then correcting to say he was on the way. At that moment, Keyes decided to kidnap Samantha. He said it hadn't been planned, and it was a spur-of-the-moment decision, based on the adrenaline rush from the robbery. Though it went against his rule, don't commit crimes where you live. He lifted himself into the kiosk window and told Samantha to get down. He warned her to not cause any trouble, and he told her he had an earpiece connected to a police scanner, so he would know if anything was to go down. He told her he was going to kidnap her for ransom, saying to her, I don't want to hurt you, but this 22 is loaded with very quiet ammo. It will kill you, so don't make me do it. He bound her hands behind her using zip ties. He closed and locked the kiosk windows and took a stack of napkins and stuffed them in Samantha's mouth. He led Samantha out of the kiosk and towards his truck, but as Keyes hadn't planned on taking a victim or using his personal vehicle, he needed to clear the passenger seat off. For hours, he drove her around in his truck. He said that he explained what was going to happen with the ransom. He said that he tried to keep her calm, and he was trying to act like a normal person, implying that he knew he wasn't a normal person, and he had likely done this before. At one point, he even had to return to the coffee stand to retrieve Samantha's car keys and phone so he could send a message to her boss and her boyfriend, Dwayne. Around 2 a.m., he brought her back to the shed in his backyard. His daughter and girlfriend were asleep in the house. He was leaving for a pre-planned trip later that morning. He knew he would need to get his daughter up in a couple hours, and he'd already ordered a cab to take him to the airport at 5 a.m. He went back to the shed and spoke to the now-tied Samantha and turned on a radio blasting heavy metal music. I'll make you comfortable, he told her. You just sit here, but I'm going to have this police scanner on me, so if I hear reports of screaming from this neighborhood or anything, any disturbance from over here, I'm going to be back here before the cops. He asked where her debit or credit card was. She said that she shared a bank account with her boyfriend and the debit card was in their truck. He got her home address and got back to the truck and then got back in his vehicle to retrieve it. That was when he had that encounter with Duane on the back porch. But he was able to get the card. He went back to the shed and got the pin from Samantha, which he carved into the card. With 5 a.m. quickly approaching, he sexually assaulted Samantha, strangled her, and then locked the shed up, showered, got changed. He then went back to the shed, rolled her body into a tarp, and hid her in a cupboard in the shed. He double-locked the shed, then he left for Alaska for his cruise. Investigators asked him, Was she alive when you left? Keyes said, That would seem like an obvious question. So she, so she was alive? Keyes then said, When I left? No. Keyes was asked if he was concerned about leaving Samantha's body in his shed while he went away. He said he wasn't concerned. He was confident that they would never be able to tie him to her abduction. He said that he'd been listening to the police scanners, and based on what he heard, he knew that the Anchorage police were already facing dead ends. Keyes decided to make some additional demands before he gave investigators more information. He wanted them to stop questioning Kimberly. As he insisted, she never had anything to do with his crimes. He also wanted officers to stop searching their home. He would give them what they needed, but the random searches needed to end, and they would need to get his permission to search. I don't want to hear about you questioning her again, Keyes told agents. There is no one who knows me, or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. They're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about the kind of things I'm telling you is me. How long have you been two different people? <laughs> long time. 14 years. Keyes said that he returned on February 18th. He said that he had continued to check the weather in Anchorage. When his daughter went to school on Monday, February 22nd, he began to dismantle the shed working from the inside first. 
He was burning wood from the shed and working around the cupboard containing Samantha's body. He also burned his clothing and shoes he had worn, as well as her purse, keeping only the cell phone and debit card. Once he had made more space inside the shed, he got her body out of the cupboard to prepare for his next move. Samantha's body had been mostly unchanged at the time due to the cold preserving the body. He purchased a bunch of makeup and decided to try and take a photo to show proof of life for the ransom. The newspaper he had used was from February 13th, a day he chose specifically because it was a day when he wasn't in Anchorage. He applied the makeup, but wasn't enough to make her look lively. He used fishing line to sew her eyes open along with clear tape to make her look like she had life. He braided her hair and propped up her body and took a photo using a Polaroid camera. He then also admitted to defiling her body. The ransom note was typed up using a manual typewriter he got at the Goodwill, and he photocopied the Polaroid to make it an even lower quality photograph. He then placed the ransom note on the bulletin board and used Samantha's cell phone to send the text message. He said that he had decided on the $30,000 because that was how much had been raised by Samantha's father. When he sent the text using Samantha's phone, he said that he had parked nearby the ransom note and waited for officers to arrive. He watched agents, a CSI van, and officers investigate the scene. He watched them for a while before going home. Agents said that while Keyes had been retelling the events of Samantha's murder, Keyes would go into a trance-like state, reliving the events with guilt, shame, but also excitement. While in his trance, he went into detail and included his thought process behind his decisions. He seemed relieved to talk to someone about it, and the agents knew it was imperative to not act shocked or disgusted despite their feelings to the contrary. The more comfortable Keyes was, the more information could be gained with his trust. He revealed the location of Samantha's body. He had dismembered the body over the course of several days. He would pack out storage bins with parts and dump it into the Matanuska Lake, an hour away from Anchorage, using an ice fishing shed he had already built. He thought dumping the body over several trips would be unsuspicious, as it was common for ice fishers to bring a few things with them. He even recounted seeing other people at the lake. He said that he had struggled to use a chainsaw to cut a hole through the ice, and remembered another fisherman looking at him quizzically, wondering why he didn't ask to use his ice drill. He said that he weighed the remains, and once the body was completely disposed of, he dismantled the fishing shack and tried to hide as much evidence as possible, though he wasn't able to get rid of everything before he was called about his sister's wedding in Texas. Samantha's body was recovered by specialized divers on April 2, 2012, a tragic end to those who had hoped for a different ending. With Keyes' confession, the FBI now had evidence needed to charge Israel Keyes with the murder of Samantha Koenig. It also opened up the door for Keyes to talk about his other crimes, crimes that the FBI had no idea about. Though they had a hunch that Keyes had done this before, they had no evidence to connect him. It was now up to FBI officials to get as much information as possible out of Israel Keys. Where we left off, Samantha Koenig's body had been recovered, and the interrogations with Keys would continue. A few FBI agents had built a rapport with Keys, and they continued to bluff that the FBI knew more than they did, with Keys himself saying, I've got a lot more stories to tell. The FBI had to comb through years of cell phone records, multiple computer hard drives, travel records, and bank history going back several years, attempting to piece together an account of his travels. Keyes' computer revealed hundreds of pictures, some of them attached to news articles, and most of them were missing persons all of varying age, gender, race, from a variety of demographics. All or none could be potential victims, but the photos included a familiar face, Samantha Koenig. There were hundreds of photos. The FBI sifted through the photos, attempting to identify all of them. When Keyes was asked if he thought he was a serial killer, he said yes. While talking to the FBI, Keyes had implied several times that there were more victims. He used that as bargaining chips to get his demands met. 
and they did get met because the FBI needed him to admit or hint to some sort of crime. At one point, Keyes needed help firing his attorney, but he wouldn't say why, but it gave the FBI leverage, a victim in exchange for assistance navigating the process of representing himself. On April 6, 2012, Keyes set up a meeting for his confession, without a lawyer and representing himself. In that meeting, he made a new demand. He wanted to be given the death penalty, and he wanted it in one year. He revealed that he had wanted his lawyer fired because his lawyer was against the death penalty. I want an execution date. For you? Yes. I want this whole thing wrapped up and over with as soon as possible. Keyes did not want to spend the rest of his life in a max security federal detention center. He also wanted the media attention minimized. He said both reasons were for his daughter. He wanted her to live a life away from his crimes, and he wanted her to have a normal life. Really big concern to me is, um, you know, my kid's going to be around. I don't want her to, like, type my name in the computer and have it pop up. I want my kid to have a chance to grow up and not have all this hanging over her head. The FBI wasn't in a position to make those promises, but said that they would need another victim in order to get the ball rolling. Keyes agreed, though he said he would only confess to the crimes he knew that they could connect him to, either from DNA or from the contents of his computer. He asked to be brought a map of Vermont. In early June 2011, Keyes had flown from Anchorage to Chicago. He rented a vehicle and drove out east. He had flown out with the intention of murdering, though he didn't know who. He had pre-chosen the place, Essex, Vermont, as he had already buried a cache of weapons, tools, zip ties, Drano, and other items several years previous in an orange Home Depot bucket. He called it a kill kit and revealed he had several of them buried in remote areas around the country. He said it was for convenience. The caches made it easier to travel through airlines, and he thought it would make it harder to track. It was an elaborate system he had developed several years prior to his rest. On June 7th, Keyes arrived in Essex and booked a hotel. He had gotten a three-day fishing license and went fishing a few times. He said that he would drive around the different neighborhoods looking for a target. Keyes said, I decided I was going to look for a house with a couple in it. I was looking for a fairly easy way to get into the garage and theirs was the first house I found that had all those things. It was after midnight when he found the house that he thought would be best. It was a single-story ranch-style home. He crept around their backyard, peering into their windows. He noted there was no sign of children or pets, and that the couple were likely older. I think I even had it pegged down just from looking at the outside because of the way they had their backyard set up. It just looked like an older couple that didn't have kids kind of house. The home belonged to retired couple Bill and Lorraine Courier. He staked out the home for hours, waiting in a wooded area. He had noticed a neighbor that kept coming in and out of his home smoking. Keys needed to wait until the man finally went to bed as he didn't want to have any witnesses. He wore all black, including a face mask and leather gloves, but he also had on a headlamp. He entered the home via a ventilation fan in the garage. Once he had access to the garage, he was able to enter the home by breaking a glass window pane in their door. He crept through the home undetected and confirmed there was a couple inside. He woke up Bill and Lorraine and zip-tied them. He said that they awoke dazed and confused and he barraged them with questions, asking for locations of their valuables, prescription drugs, weapons, and cash. He said that at one point, Lorraine had fought back, attempting to escape. He said that he became enraged by this. He didn't like that they weren't taking him seriously. He said that he was mad that they didn't understand who was in control in the situation. While he was searching the house, he noticed that Bill had a military insignia. He had realized that Bill had served in the same infantry unit he had served in, the 25th Infantry Division. He had exploited that information to manipulate Bill and keep him calm. He convinced the couple that he was only looking for drugs and money and wouldn't hurt them. Then he packed the couple into the backseat of their car, 
and drove them to abandoned house outside of Essex. At the house, he separated Bill and Lorraine. While trying to immobilize the couple in separate areas of the house, he lost control. Bill had gotten free of his bindings, and in a panic, Key shot Bill using a silenced handgun. Bill had fought to the very end. He tortured and sexually assaulted Lorraine before strangling her with a rope. Keyes had said that after the couple had been murdered, he poured Drano on their hands and faces and put their bodies in large industrial garbage bags. He then moved them to a corner of the basement and piled garbage, broken furniture, and wood on top. By the time Keyes was finished, the sun was already up and the morning commute had begun. Originally, he had planned on setting fire to the home, but it was too late. There was too much traffic and too much of a risk of the house not becoming fully engulfed before someone reported it, and then a fire investigation would reveal the bodies. Keyes said that he had rushed out of the house and left evidence behind, which had included the shells from his bullets, which was why he was certain the FBI would be able to connect him to the crimes. He felt that it might not be now, but they would eventually. The house the couriers had been murdered in was vacant and condemned to be demolished. Keyes had no idea at the time that he had confessed, but the house had been torn down with the bodies inside. The demolition company was none the wiser, and all materials from the old home were disposed of at the local landfill. Despite an extensive search, the bodies of the couriers were never found. The couriers had been reported missing the following day. Their home had provided little evidence and their car was located abandoned in a strip mall parking lot. A witness had come forward having seen a white male with long brown hair driving the courier's car. Keyes hadn't been worried though as the sketch bore little resemblance to him. The FBI had noticed that Keyes was revealing an MO, similarities between the couriers and Samantha's murder. Abduction to a secondary location, restraining with rope, death by strangulation, sexual assault. He also planned his crimes around family events with tight timelines. By doing so, it gave him a strong alibi. It also gave him a reasonable explanation for his travels. Weddings, funerals, visiting his mother were easy to explain. He would be able to dismiss any questions about his complicated travel arrangements by explaining it was cost-effective. In his confessions, Keyes revealed that he would rob banks during his travels, always smaller bank chains with less security. The robberies were more of a necessity, as he had racked up a lot of credit card debt and needed cash, but he admitted to enjoying the adrenaline rush. At the time of his arrest, it was already clear he had robbed at least one bank because of the marked cash in the car. He had revealed he was going too fast and a dye pack had exploded. He revealed that he had robbed that bank during the time that his mother had said he had gone missing. His computers revealed he spent a lot of time researching small towns, small towns that saw little crime and would have inexperienced law enforcement. He would note the towns on his maps and pre-planned places to rob while he was traveling. His computers also showed that Keyes spent a lot of time researching abandoned properties and remote churches. During his interrogations, he had been asked why he had looked at so many remote churches in Vermont, and he said he wanted to bring potential victims to a church for personal reasons, which investigators believed had a lot to do with his upbringing. Murdering and hiding bodies were no longer enough of a thrill for Keyes. He expressed a desire to have more media attention. He wanted infamy. Samantha's death had changed things for Keyes. His search history on his computer revealed that he read about it over and over and over. He even participated in online forum discussions and witnessed the pain firsthand that he had inflicted on the community. He had planned future crimes to have more media attention. He had spent hours planning how he wanted his future crimes to play out. He admitted he was arrested before he can act his new methods, however he did try, but he found it difficult to find victims in Texas. He said that people in Texas were more suspicious of outsiders and were less likely to take their personal safety for granted. He had been deterred from abducting a woman when he noticed she had a large dog with her. 
He did admit to setting a house on fire in Alito, Texas in order to cause a distraction so he could rob a bank during the time that he had been unaccounted for. In total, Keyes sat for more than 40 hours of interviews with the FBI over the eight months of his incarceration. During those interviews, he gave several clues to additional victims. He didn't give clues for free, though. He would exchange information for copies of the New York Times, access to the internet, cigars, Americanos, candy bars, and fast food. I can give you the rest of the story, like, you know, everything that happened. If I get a cigar. <laughs> We're going to go through some of those crimes he either alluded to or could potentially be linked based on interrogations and evidence found. The FBI believes his first murder victims were carried out when he was 18, when his family had moved from Colville, Washington, and there'd been about a month before Israel had joined them. Julie Marie Harris disappeared on March 3, 1996. She was 12 years old and was a Special Olympics athlete with two prosthetic feet. She vanished from Colville while waiting for a ride to church. Decades later, friends of Julie had been interviewed and one of those friends said that she remembered seeing Israel Keys. She said that she saw him having a conversation with Julie at the pool where she often swam. She said that Julie had given Keyes her address and phone number. Months after her disappearance, her prosthetics were found at the mouth of the Colville River, and her remains were found a year later. No forensic evidence was ever recovered in that case, and though Keyes said he wasn't involved, he admitted to knowing about the case and gave visual cues to investigators that indicated to them that there was more to the story. There was also another double murder in Colville around the same time. 12-year-old Cassie Emerson had been abducted on June 27, 1996. It was believed that she had been kidnapped from her trailer home, which had been destroyed by arson, and had also contained her deceased mother, Marlene Emerson. Cassie's body was discovered five miles away from her home in a wooded area near Logging Road. The similarities to Julie's murder tied the two crimes together, and it was believed they were committed by the same person. There were no other similar crimes in Colville or any area nearby after Israel moved from the area, and he had admitted to agents that the first time he committed arson, it was to a trailer home. The first crime that he admitted to was the sexual assault of a girl at the Deschutes River in Oregon in 1997 or 1998. At the time, he was living in the area in Maupin and was around 20 years old. He said that he'd been watching a group of teens floating down the river on inner tubes. He watched as one of the girls became separated from her friends. She was close to the shore, and he grabbed her and dragged her to an outhouse. He said that he had planned on killing her after he sexually assaulted her, but she kept talking to him, humanizing herself. And he said that he lost his nerve... That victim has never come forward, but FBI agents said it was her humanizing herself that had likely saved her life. She told him her name and just talked about anything and everything, trying to build a connection. She had also stayed calm during the entire thing, and Keyes had found that unsettling. He let her go, though he admitted it was one of his greatest regrets, as it plagued him for years. It was the only witness he had ever allowed to get away and she'd seen his face. She was uh, talking to me and telling me, you know, saying, oh, you're a good-looking guy, why are you, you know, you don't have to do this. I probably would have even gone out with you and all this stuff. And things never got really violent like they could have if she had been fighting me or something. She was pretty smart. She was, I mean, because it worked, I didn't, I didn't, the main thing is I just lost my nerve right at the end. He claimed his time in the military had kept him busy. However, when he was discharged from the army, he started stalking and planning his next victim right away. He claimed to have committed at least four murders while he lived in Washington. The first was an unidentified couple in the early 2000s. He said he had murdered and buried their bodies somewhere in Washington, but he didn't disclose anything more than that. 
He had two additional murders in 2005 and 2006, though he wouldn't specify any further than that. They had been separate victims, and he revealed the location of where one of his victims could possibly be found, but relished that they would likely never find it. You guys know about Lake Crescent in Washington, right? I think that lake is about five to 700 feet deep. He had purchased a boat off of Tammy's ex-husband and had used that boat to dispose of one or more of his victims. In 2006, Keyes' cell phone records had placed him in Washington near where a high-profile murder had occurred near Pinnacle Lake on the Snohomish County Trail. A mother and daughter, Mary Cooper and Susanna Stodden, had been hiking when they were both shot and killed on the trail. Their murder has never been solved and remains a mystery. Though there is no physical evidence to link Keyes to the murder, it fit his M.O., and at the time of the murder, it was one of the times when Keyes' cell phone had been unable to track for several hours. Another one of Keyes' signatures. Over the years, he admitted to frequenting sex workers in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. At his home in Anchorage, he had several phone numbers for people he liked to go out with. This was another trait he shared with several serial killers. Sex workers were potential victims. The vulnerabilities involved in their line of work make them a target for sexual sadists like Keys, often serving as practice, knowing that missing person investigations were limited if they were even investigated at all. He said that he had another victim that he had abducted from the East Coast in 2009, then disposed of their body in upstate New York. Though Keyes himself didn't confirm, when he was shown a picture of the victim, he said, I'm not ready to talk about that one, leading the FBI to strongly believe that 49-year-old Deborah Feldman is a confirmed victim. Deborah had gone missing from her home in New Jersey on April 8th. Her remains were never recovered. Keyes had said something about one of his victims being a woman with pale skin who possibly came from money and agents were able to place him in Indiana at the time when a young woman had gone missing. It had been a high-profile missing persons case, and one that Keyes had searched on his computer multiple times. Lawrence Spear was 20 years old, a University of Indiana student, and had gone missing in the early morning hours on June 3rd in 2011. She had gone out with friends and was seen heavily intoxicated. She'd been seen on surveillance not wearing shoes, walking home around 4.30 a.m. She had left her cell phone and shoes at the bar and had dropped her purse and keys along the way. She never made it home and was never located. When Keys was asked if he had anything to do with Lauren's disappearance, he didn't give a definitive answer. Without more evidence, it is unlikely that these cases will ever be tied back to Keys officially. There is also no way of knowing for sure how many victims are out there. Based on his travels, cell phone records, potential evidence on his computer, the scope is just too wide. In addition to his time in the military and work as a park ranger, Keyes had also stated that he'd considered becoming a police officer. He felt that being a police officer would give him the perfect cover to hunt for victims. He imagined driving around at night and using the police lights to pull over victims, but ultimately decided being a self-employed contractor made more sense to him. In May of 2012, Keyes had attempted to escape court during a hearing. The FBI had wanted to move him to a more secure facility, but he couldn't get moved until he was charged and sentenced. They didn't feel that the correctional officers in Anchorage understood how dangerous Keyes was, both to himself and others. He was supposed to be monitored 24-7 with armed guards and frequent check-ins. He also wasn't allowed anything with a sharp edge or anything that could be a tool to harm himself. He had been given a pencil and had slowly worked to whittle it with his teeth into a lock-picking tool for his handcuffs and leg irons. He had been saving plastic wrap from his meals to make rope, and was also found to be saving all the pieces of dental floss he'd been given daily. It was the plastic wrap and the lead lock picks that allowed him to get out of his cuffs and leg irons in court in May. Despite the warnings and this escape attempt, the Anchorage Corrections hadn't taken any of the necessary precautions the FBI had outlined, and it didn't change anything after. 
On December 1st, 2012, it was discovered that Keyes had committed suicide by cutting his wrists. He had managed to get a razor blade back to his cell and had been left unsupervised for several hours. A note had been found that consisted of an ode to murder letter, as well as 12 drawings. The drawings were in Keyes' own blood and were 11 skulls and one pentagram with the phrase, We are one written on the bottom. It could be a hint detailing how many victims he has in total, or it could be completely meaningless. There really is no way to know for sure. A lot of people look at how Israel Keyes was caught as a reflection of how he was as a criminal. The kidnapping and murder of Samantha Koenig had been his unraveling. No one really knows for sure what was going on, but multiple people had speculated that his drinking was out of hand, and they thought he was likely using harder substances. Many people in his life had noted that he was calm, collected, and always put together, but in 2012 they had noticed a different side of Keyes, one that was impulsive, erratic, and disorganized. Keyes even said about himself, back when I was smart, admitting that he even recognized something had changed. Back when I was smart, I would, um do it. I would let them come to me. Many serial killers want to be caught. They also want recognition and notoriety. He also said that his long-term girlfriend Kimberly's relationship had run its course. Like we see with many other serial killers, disruptions in the home or close relationships can set off a chain of events. We saw that with the Golden State Killer. His divorce had led to a months-long murder spree. Keyes went for years, possibly decades, with methodical, organized, and pre-planned crimes. He had buried weapon caches for years, keeping track of all of their locations for sometimes years only in his head, carrying out numerous crimes without leaving physical evidence, his elaborate traveling routes all using paper maps and keeping hours of research only in his mind. Up until 2012, he didn't make mistakes. We can only link crimes to him based on his travels. Many of his victims' bodies were never recovered. The FBI theorized that he would commit crimes in one state, bring them to a secondary location, potentially in another state, and dump their bodies in a third location. This is why he's considered one of the most dangerous, methodical, and chilling serial killers of his time. And that is going to be where we're going to end this video and this series. I don't do serial killer deep dives very often, and I appreciate all of your support on these videos as they take a long time to research and put together. If you like this series, I highly recommend my deep dives into the Golden State Killer. I will link that in the description box below. If you like this series, please let me know in the comments down below and feel free to suggest another serial killer deep dive. As always, please give this video a thumbs up if you like the content, and subscribe for more if you haven't already. If you've done all that and want to support me and the channel, we have channel membership as well as Patreon to get early access, members-only content, and more. We also have merch and other goodies in the description box below, as well as links to all my socials. But until then, I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.